Christians. Jeff Christians attending from Holland, Michigan. Unfortunately, not Florida. Williams. Travis Williams attending teleconference from Holland, Michigan. Hemingway. Uh, Tim Hemingway attending via teleconference from Holland, Michigan. Corbin? Uh, Corbin attending via teleconference from Holland, Michigan. And Peugeot. Yeah, Brian Peugeot attending virtually from Holland, Michigan. You have a quorum, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Mr. Van Beek. Appreciate your help. And Tasinka for always getting us prepared ahead of time. She's not in sitting in on this, but she makes it all happen. Um, we kick things off with uh, the, approving the meeting minutes from last time. Any, I'll move. Thank you, Tim. Any second? For any discussion or comments on the meeting minutes, corrections that need to be made? No, no typos this time, Nikki? <gasps> Not that I know. I didn't even read them, Tim, you know? <laughs> okay. No, they're fine. All righty. All in favor of approving the meeting minutes as written, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you, folks. The meeting minutes are approved as written and presented. Uh, moving along to public comment. Any one on the Zoom call have a good word for us today? I would love to give public comment, yes. Great, I don't see where that's coming from. Is that you, Shanley? Yep, that's me. All right, Shanley Poole, hit us with your best shot. All right, my name is Shanley Poole. I live on 18th and Pine of Holland, Michigan. And I am the Holland Climate Collaborative intern. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you again for the work you do. I understand you're gonna be talking about education and transportation in future meetings. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say about that. Um, today, I have the joy of presenting some exciting results from a phone bank survey conducted by West Michigan Environmental Action Council. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to screen share um, oh, it looks like I cannot screen share. Yeah, I think you just get to talk to us for three minutes and that's all. Right. All right, <laughs> thank you for clarifying that. No problem. Um, then I will just read off this information to you guys. We recently conducted a phone bank survey in which we asked uh, or we presented the statements, climate change is affecting weather patterns in Michigan. Climate change is affecting water levels in Lake Michigan. It is the local, the responsibility of local governments to protect their communities. And lastly, local governments should take action to prepare their communities for the effects of climate change. In each of these instances, the, respond, the respondents, over 1,400 individuals from Ottawa County, affirmed these statements in landslide proportions. Uh, to the first statement, we received 71% in agreement to climate change is affecting weather patterns in Michigan. To the second statement, climate change is affecting water levels in Lake Michigan, we received 64% affirming. To the third, we, we received a remarkable 74% affirming to it is the responsibility of local governments to protect their communities. And to the last statement, local governments should take action to prepare their communities for the effects of climate change. We received 68% affirming. Now, when looking specifically at respondents from Holland and the city of Holland within Ottawa County, we received even more affirmations. Uh, all of them cleared 70%. And to the last statement, local governments should take action to prepare their communities for the effects of climate change. An overwhelming 76% of respondents. Oh, shoot, I lost contact. 
No, you're there. No, you're there. Oh, oh good. Thank you. My window yeah. just disappeared. <laughs> Thanks. 76% of respondents affirmed that last one. Mm -hmm. So our data here goes to show that Holland recognizes the toll of climate change as it has been happening to our state and our lake. Um, Holland not only recognizes the effects of climate change to our state, it craves leaders that are going to take action and provide for our city. And I'm incredibly grateful and optimistic for the chance that you all have to be some of those leaders um, as you craft this new energy proposal. So thank you for your time and diligence throughout this process. And I hope that this data encourages you as much as it has encouraged me. Thank you guys. Thanks, thank you. Can I make a comment? You may, Peter. It's exactly that time. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, Peter Bogart, 235 North Lindy in Zealand. And I just wanted to just briefly take note of the community energy plan itself, which is loosely built around a triple bottom line format. And one of those triple bottom lines is environment. So these days, the quintessential environmental issue is climate change. And given the seriousness with which climate, uh, science is telling us we need to respond, I'm just encouraging the uh, strategic development team to spend some time listening to, or maybe bringing in folks who can help you understand where that science is coming from and, and what it's telling us. Um, you know, triple bottom lines basically indicate that each one of those factors is sort of co-equal. You need to win in all three arenas. And uh, I would like to see us uh, reflect more on climate change because I think it has some real bearing on the kind of goal that the strategic team ultimately sets. You know, I think the current goal of 10 metric tons per person per year is good, but I think the window in which the current plan tries to accomplish that is not consistent with today's science. So I'm encouraging some review and kind of getting some folks in line who can help you uh, work through all of that kind of material. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Anyone else care to share? <clears throat> I will wait a couple more seconds in case you think you are talking and you are on mute. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, moving on to receiving and filing online public comments. Um, can I have a, I believe I, we need to motion to have them as part of the record and then we can chat about them if we deem, if we want to. So can I have a motion to include the online comments as part of the record? So move. Oh, I think I heard a second there. Who was that? That was Nikki. Nikki, thanks, Nikki. Mm -hmm. um, anyone want to comment on the online submitted comments? Or are we? We're not allowed to, right? I think we can. Well, I can't. I don't remember. Keith, Member you... members may. Members, we are members. You're saying yeah, members. Once there's a motion to support on the floor, you can. Uh -huh. I just, I just want to say I appreciate that the all the comments, whether they go to council or to this uh, group, are included. I I, uh, I asked for that, and I appreciate that that's happening. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks, Scott. Just put in the chat, and I don't know if Shanley, you saw this in the chat or not. I don't know if you can see the chat, but. Um, maybe for next time's meeting, you can send uh, us oh. online all the survey results that you were referencing. Uh, Scott uh, mentioned that in the chat, and I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I think that would be great to have the hard copy. Oh, Jeff wants a hard copy. So no, like, no. The, in the out and bring it to his, he's at Hope College. Yeah. <laughs> if you can bring it to my mailbox. <laughs> no, Brian. This house. Hey, sustainability. Don't print it out. Don't print it out. Jeez. Digitally. 
<laughs> no, the, the, yeah, that would be great. Um, any other comments before we acknowledge the online comments? Okay, all in favor of submitting those as presented into the meeting record. Aye or hand, please. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Wonderful. Those comments are included and acknowledged. Um, let's talk about how we want to do public engagement uh, over the next couple of months or whatever time frame. Years. <laughs> we, uh, in the survey that we did a couple of months ago, we got uh, at the bottom, people put some groups in that we thought would be worth um, touching base with. Mm -hmm. So I think the point of this part of the sec uh, meeting today is to be intentional around like, okay, who do we want to hear from? How do we want to go about doing that? What time frame? And we can at least begin having that discussion before we jump into the educational topic for the day. Yeah, I can start, of course. Um, I think there should be a number of groups. And I think I would, I would like to hear from the Hope Science Department. We have Dr. Christians here, of course. Uh, but there's a lot of um, talent there I would like to hear from. I'd like to hear from businesses in town. And that was mentioned at one point. There are places in town. Eventually, as this plan gets uh, formulated and out in the community, we'll need everyone's buy-in to make it work. So if we could hear from some businesses um, and what they're doing and what they think, um, we could have um, members of neighborhood groups. Uh, apparently the first CEP was done with input from ordinary citizens. And if we could have either different wards or different um, neighborhood groups like West Corps and, and kind of what are they doing and what do they think? Because they're, they are the ones who will be affected also. We could have members of churches. And what other, there's another group I was thinking. Oh, exactly what, what um, well, Peter Bogart spoke, uh, there are a couple of climate groups in town, the Climate Collaborative and the Holland Climate Collaborative. And there is also a climate change lobby and they have done a lot of work. And while we have done a lot of work and we're getting information, they also have some information. And I don't think any of us need to reinvent the wheel. So let's see what everyone has to say. I do have some anxiety that we leave enough time for all of this too. We've spent a lot of time on data gathering and this is another form of data gathering that I hope we, we do leave time for. Well, I think that there's a couple ways to go about getting educated. You know, I think there's offering groups the ability to literally speak to us if that makes sense but I think something that would be much more uh, concise from a time perspective is we could create surveys of questions and send them out to the groups and solicit feedback that way and that doesn't that, that can be you know quite expedited um, relative to like you know hearing from different churches about what they think you know in a meeting setting so, and it's probably like a hybrid uh, approach. You know, some folks we may want to directly hear from and other folks, a survey is probably all we could expect someone to answer is my, is my thought. Hmm. Um, so Nikki, I heard Hope Science Department, businesses, uh, wards slash people, uh, faith- Those would be your surveys faith communities and uh, the, the 
how is climate collaborative? I don't know that other group. Um, the climate change lobby. Is that a, that's a local group? It's an actually it's a national group with a local chapter. It has a local chapter. Okay. And they've been following, and especially the local group has a lot of information that we may find useful. We'll never know. Just like we belong to some groups um, that, uh, and on our resource document, we have the IC. L E I, you know, we have we use a lot of those resources, or we should. There's so much information we don't need to discover ourselves. It's already out there. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to have the outside groups. Uh, one of the best uh, sessions we had, I felt, uh, was the carbon offset and uh, uh, renewable energy credits talks. It was, it was that was really informative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any swaths of people in town or groups in town that were that were missing from this list? Say that again. Is there any like for the rest of the committee? Or is there are, are any other groups? Any that, other sectors? Yeah, that were sectors that we need to add to this list that that Nikki didn't include. Ryan, this is Scott. Ryan. Okay, I oh, guess I, one Scott. thing I would say, Brian, is I feel like um, a little bit of this would be better dictated if we formulated what questions we were gonna ask, and then that would help us determine how we send this out and, and who it's going to. And to um, it, it feels a little bit like we're going about at the backwards way because quite frankly I wouldn't mind putting it in the hand of every single resident of the city of Holland right like if that's possible I guess and I, I I would be curious if there's a budget to do something here and how we could equitably go about sharing this because I don't think it's necessarily fair to say like well let's ask you know these four groups but not these other four groups because why are we making those kind of decisions? If we can come up with a tool where we can, you know, it, it, what would be great is if we could hire somebody to facilitate uh, a survey to get data back to very specific questions that we could use to help, you know, organize our thoughts going forward, I guess. I, that's my initial gut reaction to it. So and we can bring in other groups, but I guess I just want to know what you're asking them because I don't really feel like we just want to free for all, like, invite a whole bunch of groups in and let them all lecture us on whatever they think. Not that they wouldn't be right, but I just think we ought to have some, some structure parameters to what we're trying to do and structure to it. Yeah, yep, I agree. Scott, were you trying to say something? I'm sorry. I don't know if I could hear you. No, I think Travis indicated exactly what I was feeling is that oftentimes we, we ask these groups, we already know what many of them have to say on this issue. I'm not sure we know collectively how the citizens um, feel. We know how groups feel. We just not, I'm not sure if we understand how the, our citizens as a whole feel. So anything that we do going forward, I think we should at least consider what Travis has mentioned. Do we, uh, Brian, do we have a budget um, that or, or, or source of funding for us to do, do a, uh, we could do an online survey, but, or, or phone survey, et cetera. But, but the first question is, do we have monies to do that? Uh, I got like a $10 bill in my wallet. I have no <laughs> idea. What the, I, we may, maybe I have literally no idea. Keith, do we have a budget for something like this? Yeah, I'm looking through Zoom at Dave Coster too, but we did have some money set aside for this process for, and we kept it real broad, like for consultant type support. So, so doing some type of a, a survey, a tool, anything like that, yes. Um, I, I apologize, I don't know exactly the number off the top of my head, but we can get that. I believe it, well, I believe that the number is 100K, but I don't I don't know for sure, Keith, on that. Is that per week? 
<laughs> just kidding, just kidding. They're going to um, out of our meeting. There's, yeah. Dave, are you being are you are you being like serious that that it could be a hundred thousand dollar budget? Yeah, because we considered that there, the Ford Mobility proposal, for example, might be something that this group would actually take on uh, potentially, and so. There's that kind of number, I think, that's in there. Again, I could be a little little off. It's, it's not a small number. Um, you know, if you look at the kind of work that was done in creating the plan the first time around, I mean, it was it was definitely a um, six-figure oh, yeah. plus type of engagement. <laughs> yeah. Which should just give you a little bit of idea of the kind of value that Keith and I are bringing to the... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, we, we did put a fairly decent placeholder in this. And again, it's it's flexible in terms of its use. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I, and everyone, that uh, budget is in the Holland Energy Fund budget. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I, I concur that um, it would be great for us to have uh, feedback from our community. Um, and the question is, what mechanism could we choose to be able to move forward on that? You know, I'm familiar with, um, via my experience with HBPW, that uh, Frost Research uh, provides service on being able to conduct various types of surveys. Um, those, uh, Dave, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, are both a phone survey and digital or just the phone? No, they'll do both phone and they'll do web-based and others yeah. uh, because I think one of the things you'll find in our experience in doing annual customer satisfaction surveys and the city just did a, uh, a survey that was much broader in scope, but there's certain demographics in the community that are going to uh, respond to phone versus digital and vice versa. So in order to yep. make sure that you get a fairly good cross Cross section. cross section of the community, yep. you know, there are different ways of, of uh, engaging that are important in those kind of surveys. Keith, I just wants to add on to that, I think. Yeah, I, Dave covered that well. We just did a citizen survey, Tim. And one of the things that I think this group would want to talk about when you do surveys like that also, um, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong, but sometimes if you just do this open-ended survey, well, then... Um, it's not statistically significant in the, in the sense that, you know, sometimes like people could um, not be residents or, you know, you'd have, it wouldn't be representative of the demographics or anything like that. Um, and that's a way to do it, right? Or, but the way that like the BPW in the city, when we do our surveys, uh, we make sure that the Frost Center, and they're very good at this, where you get a representative sample of the citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's another way to do it. Um, so this group would just have to talk through, like, what are you trying, like, <laughs> what, are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Right. Well, what methodology do you want to use? Yeah. I, I think there's at, at least, maybe more, but at least three distinct surveys we're talking about here. I think that we need to be intentional around engaging the business community and we can do that through the chamber or Lakeshore Advantage or direct to the major users. Um, you know, like good old fashioned one-on-one -on -one sit down, you know, whatever, cause there's only whatever, 20, 10 or 20 major users um, in town. So that I think is one, like, what do we want to ask the business community? There's such a big part of the actual carbon footprint. Um, we need to hear from them. Mm -hmm. The resident one makes perfect sense. Some sort of like hit everybody um, that lives in town. I, again, I have no idea how to do that, but it sounds like people have a good concept here. And then the third one I think is, um, and this is a big group, so maybe this has got subcategories, but I think nonprofits call those church faith communities, but I think, you know, like I'm involved with community action house and um, there's good Sam and the rescue mission. There's a lot of nonprofits that I think um, represent folks that may not, you know, respond to a survey potentially. It's just another way I think to sort of get at as many people groups as possible. Um, and I'm pretty certain we could work with Sisler at Lakeshore Nonprofit Alliance to get in front of those folks. 
Yeah, Pat, Patrick's got the connectivity on that. So, yep. I, I think that one of the things that would be great is if we could actually, if we have a budget and the group feels in agreement with this, I, I think a lot of what we're talking about, there's people out there that do this for a living. Um, and if we were to engage with a professional, they can help us craft the questions, they can help us put together the process so that we are doing it in a non-biased and equitable way. And to me, that that's important on something like this, mm -hmm. um, even down to the demographic you survey, right? Because as much as I, you know, ODC owns land in like three different townships and two different cities and everything else. And we, we certainly care about the environment and do everything we can for it. The reality is, I think if I was just following the charter, which we were given, we're supposed to do this for the city of Holland. So making sure that our demographic approach focuses on the community that we're supposed to be working within too, um, is important. Uh, and I just, I just, and again, I don't say that because I don't want to hear from somebody outside or something, but I think we just have to be honest about what our charge is. And, and, and that actually helps narrow down the scope of what we're supposed to be or who we're going to contact as well. So, um, but I think if you get somebody, I mean, it could be the Frost Center or whoever, you get a professional to do this work for us. Um, I, you know, they can help craft questions so they're not leading questions because most surveys are they have leading questions that are getting people to think about the answer before they answer. And um, we want to try to do something that's, you know, done in a really, a really bulletproof way of getting really solid data. That would be my one stake in the ground, I guess I would put on this. And I'd love to see that happen. Yeah, and I agree with uh, Brian that there are not only different kinds of surveys for different populations, but different ways of doing it. Right. Like I would, like with the nonprofits, and I would suggest there are groups like the Hope Science Department who have data, who have done the local stuff or the um, one of the climate groups, they have studied this area. Um, I don't think it's going to be exceptionally useful for our crafting a whatever product we end up with to say, um, you know, most of the people, most of the population in the Holland area is in favor of doing something about climate change. That doesn't help me particularly, except I, it's great to know, <laughs> but if you're going to create a document, I want to know what Hope has to say. We, we know uh, we have the, with some information from BPW, we have some information from the carbon offset group. You know, we're looking for information, uh, but different kinds of, whether it's a survey or sitting down with people or having someone come to, come to us, Zoom to us, they're uh, what they do. I, well, I think to, to add to that, Nikki, I think the questions are not, do you believe in climate change or not? I think the questions are more specific about you know, would you implement X or would you be a user of X or Y? Or like, you can get down to like getting them to give us feedback on what would be the best things. Cause the, the city of Holland is not trying to decide in, in my understanding, if they're going to do something on climate change or not, the city of Holland is doing something on climate change. And we're trying to figure out what are the best mechanisms to do that would best serve the needs of our community. And therefore our questions have to be crafted to get to that, not whether or not it's climate change is real or not. That's not what we're arguing about um, or that's what we're trying to decide here. So I wanna make sure those questions are questions that give us information that can be translated into an action step, not just general information about how somebody feels. Good, Good. Yeah. that would be part of our education component too, I hope. Uh, a question for uh, Dave Coster or, or Keith. Um, based on your experiences, uh, are there professionals in the community that could assist us in putting together um, um, the, the survey for the, and define, help define the, the different sectors uh, to make sure that we're getting a good cross-sectional view, um, but also to Travis's point of um, what I'd call quantitative 
uh, types of questions that will help us um, go towards our, one of those goals and objectives that we look in the three to five year uh, time, time span. So Dave, Dave and uh, Keith, do we have, I mean, you know, I immediately think of somebody like Hari, but I'm not sure she is one that would be doing a survey of this type, um, but I know there have got to be. No, I think you, you, you want kind of, you know, survey professionals. I think, you know, yeah. as Travis correctly points out, you know, yeah. how you ask the question is really critical. I think oh, getting, you know, a response that isn't sort of fed to somebody as opposed to really sort of deeply within their belief system. Um, and I, and so I think that's, uh, uh, you know, something that, you know, like the frost center obviously is a, is a, is an important potential entity to look to, especially since the BPW and the city have experience, uh, working with, uh, Julie Ornay over at, uh, at that organization. Um, have you know, they, so that would be probably my first. Have they you know, assisted Dave, um, BPW in the city in the formulation of the survey or? Yeah, absolutely. Them? Matter of fact, they're also working on the development of a broadband survey right now yep. for the yep. task force that's looking at that. I mean, that's, you know, so we'll, they do a, a good job of, of really sort of not only thinking about how to engage the different segments of the community, but also, you know, how to structure the questions that, you know, get you what you want in terms of valuable feedback. And I think, you know, what you're talking about in terms of, um, especially what Travis started mentioning in terms of being able to test these concepts, mm -hmm. this work that you're doing right now today will put you at three out of the five levers that we've been through in terms of education and then, and then start to think about the strategies over the next three to five years. I think, you know, what you, my suggestion is that, you know, the, the questions really be structured around, um, you know, how the community would react to, you know, the pursuit of those strategies, uh, mm -hmm. especially where there's going to be a need for um, action on the part of the community, you know, in terms of engaging with it and actually being part of the journey and part of the solution and partnership with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you want to be able to test sort of their appetite for, for um, coming alongside the, the city on, on those things. Yep. That'd be my suggestion. Good. Yep. They've nailed that, Tim. And the only other thing that I would add just in the conversation is, should it be Frost or I'm familiar um, with working with other entities too, but I wouldn't say that the other entities were better than Frost. Um, you know, just in the last two months, we've had a great, great experience with the Frost Center. Mm -hmm. um, using them though, what their expertise would be again, to have kind of a methodology that they use that they make sure that they get a cross section of the community. Yep. Um, so the other component that you, that you may want to consider, because like I think Brian said, like ask every resident, the Frost Center would not ask every resident. Hmm. Um, that, that just, that's not how those, those surveys are done. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I think that you may want to consider, um, and of course, COVID makes that more complicated, right? Mm -hmm. I think at some point you want to consider that you would have, just like Dave did a great job of describing, like, okay, here are the things that from an SDT perspective, we have potentially on the table as far as potential strategies or mm -hmm. conversations that you've had. Mm -hmm. I think you might want to have, in addition to like the targeted groups that you've talked about and maybe a specific a survey through a frost center, probably some way, somehow you want to have just basically open to anyone and everyone and that we'd advertise. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And unfortunately, right, typically we'd be like, hey, let's let's take out the civic center and a night or in Saturday morning or something and have one of those. So we're just going to have to figure out what the best methodology potentially for doing those currently are. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of really great examples of community <coughs> those in mass, but right. I think that's something that we'll have to, you know, I would encourage you all to consider what that might look like also. Good. Yeah. 
Yes. So, so like, how would we, how would a group like this in the open format that we live in uh, reach out to an entity like Frost and, and scope out something that they could come back to us with a proposal that we could review and then say, oh, almost, let's tweak it. And I mean, how do we, how do we move forward considering the nature of this beast here? I you think direct just, Dave, you would direct yeah. Dave or I to basically go or, or together <laughs> and uh, we'll, and, and. and we'll do that and we'll bring, and we'll bring that back to you for consideration. Yeah. And I think, I think if it's frost, I mean, obviously I think, uh, you know, again, uh, um, they would be willing to participate and get a spot on one of your next meetings here, whenever that proposal could be developed. We heard what you had to say in terms of kind of, you know, the possibility that this could be something where there's a general population survey, and then there's maybe more of a targeted in terms of some, some key groups, whether it's business sector, um, and uh, not for profit sector. I mean, I think we can explore that uh, with an entity that provide a survey, get a proposal in terms of how they would do that. And also probably a recommended time frame for that given where you are in your process. Is this the kind of thing where we would have a two-parter, you know, where we do something on a limited scale on things that are necessary, not necessarily need to be as developed as having all of the potential list of strategies Mm -hmm. Or would it be something where all the list of strategies have been sort of formulated from this group? You've had a chance to hear from Joe Sigma about comparable communities and things like that. And now we kind of have this list that we want to formulate questions around those lists, especially if there are um, things that the community is going to be asked to, you know, be involved with in terms of part of that part of that journey. So. So we can, Keith and I can start to do that legwork at this point and start to think about, um, you know, how to get a proposal back in front of this group and then, you know, have that dialogue directly between this group and, and the individuals that would be putting together the serving instrument. Nikki? Chair, may I? Yes. Respond? Um, yes. Should, should we have, when we uh, talk about the education, the strategy, should we, what, should we have some kind of, I mean, what's our goal? What, is, what would we tell them? We're redoing the community energy plan. I mean, we have a number of things we want to address. Do we even know? I mean, we've been just been gathering data at this point. Well, all the way along the process here, we've been proposing strategies in the three to five year time frame, and we've got a list of them for the first two levers. And theoretically, after today, there'll be another lever that you can chew on and develop strategy. It's all part of the opportunity matrix. Right. So at the end of the day, when we get through all five levers, we'll have strategies proposed for all five of those levers that, uh, you know, I think that's what you'd be testing at that point um, is, are these levers appropriate? Are these levers for, um, I think that, I think that there is a nuanced layer there that Nikki's getting at is, is uh, like, I get like, Hey, here's the stuff we're looking at. Like, you know, how motivated by it are you or how much do you like it or however they would phrase it. And it's like more, you know, not tactical, but like these strategic initiatives in nature. I do think though, there's an element of, and I don't know how this would get captured, but um, like I think about like for businesses, right? Like asking the question, is sustainability part of your strategy? And to what degree is it? Isn't is not a question really about our levers, but it is a question that I think drives how aggressive we would be in crafting some of these plans. Because if LG Chem and name these, you know, the top ten users were like, yeah, we're we've got a carbon neutral goal by X Y date, and it's a huge part of our strategy. Like that inform, I think that that level of, you know, depending on what they say would inform what we might move forward into the three to five year strategy or take out, correct? Yeah, I mean, you, you could ask something along the lines of, you know, to what extent are you relying upon the community to deal with your 
your climate related goals or your sustainability related goals. Um, Cause maybe they're not, maybe, and maybe they don't want the community to do that. I don't know. I mean, I, if that's what you're trying to get at, Brian, I mean, I think you can, you can ask questions like that. Um, you can ask again, if the community were to try to do things that supported your sustainability goals, which, which types of initiatives would be the most important to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, oh, yeah. Go ahead, yeah, well, you, I mean, I, 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 that brings me to our resource document, no, our, the thing that the, the final, what do you call it, the summary um, that says our goals, and Dave, you asked about this way long ago, is it economic, then affordable and reliable, then environmental? Maybe now it's affordable and reliable with the environment and economic, uh, will follow that economic competitiveness will follow that if you have those two somehow we have to uh in, include that in our questions in our survey because that's what's the basis of this document and and do we agree with it or do they shift those um there's some are long term some are short term and are they shifting and is that part of our uh questioning with this yeah, ultimately, that's a decision that you guys are going to have to decide on and getting good input there is important. And then council is going to decide on that. What I would point out, though, too, is what Dave and I will do. I, I think it totally makes sense that we're not going to send the same survey out, let's say, to citizens that we are to businesses, businesses. That we are to nonprofits. Correct. Yeah. It's three it's three distinct stakeholder groups that need their own set of relevant questions. Right. Because to your point, Brian, I mean you might actually, and if we do what Dave was suggesting, which may be a really good idea here, is you do a multi-part survey to them because maybe your questions are things like, do you have a sustainability plan? Um, what is your, are you aiming to be carbon neutral? I mean, I'm, I'm making up bad questions right now, but if you find <laughs> out that 20 businesses, major businesses in town all have a carbon neutral goal by 2030 and, or 2025 or whatever they might be aiming for, that impacts what we're doing because we've said all along, we're factoring in like we're not factoring in their goals in our decisions and what the numbers that we're looking at. We don't know what those goals are. If I learned that these 12, whatever X, Y, Z companies all had specific goals in mind, I would be inclined to set up a meeting and try to talk with each one of them or send, you know, Joe Sycamore or whoever from the, like to talk to them to find out what those are so that that could be used in our grander plan. Like, I just feel like that's information. We're, we're having conversations right now, void of all the details. And, and there's a lot of people making a lot of assumptions that things are or are not happening. And we need to kind of boil that down so that we are on a more level ground to step forward with. Right, yeah, I 100% I, uh, agree. I mean, and I can tell you without naming names, unequivocally that businesses, big businesses in town do have very aggressive goals that are faster and more aggressive than the cities. Right. And, the, and the gap in that knowledge is what we want to close. Correct. Right. right. And that, so that's the so that's the business to your original point. The business thing is its own thing. I don't think it requires the frost center. It require, but maybe, well, maybe it does to help us craft like super neutral questions, but we know how to get a hold of these major industrial users, right? Like, I don't think that that's a real mystery, but then the nonprofits is its own thing. And then the, and the residents I'm totally lost on. I don't know how we would go about doing that and what would be relevant. And so, yeah, I think it's three different, similar, but different, uh, you know, initiatives. Keith? So, so my experience, and this is what I do, right? Working with groups <laughs> is I think Dave and I hear generally what, what it is that you're looking for. And I'm sure we won't get it 100% right, which is great, but we'll bring something back to all of you that you can react to, that you can noodle on, that you can provide input on. And um, that, that's what I would strongly recommend is the best, the best way forward. Okay. Good. Uh, Jeff, Tim, or Scott, does that sound okay to you? Yep, that sounds good. That sounds great. Yeah, I think the 
Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Because my comment would be, I think the, um, you know, the business decision I, I would put further up on the timeline compared to the all resident survey. I think that's probably the all resident thing is probably where we're going to have most everything fleshed out. The business survey, I think, may inform more what our lever or what our strategies might be, where we can yeah. see how can we partner more directly with your goals rather than us come in with ours and you come in with yours and then we both try to do our own thing. Yeah. That would be my one comment is I think that as far as timing, that seems to make more sense to me. I think you're thinking about that the right way, Jeff. And, and Dave, you probably are already thinking this way, but I think it's actually two segments. I think there's one survey for your major 20, 25 users. And then there's a business survey that goes to everybody else yeah. because they're, you know, like that's, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm the, talking about, Brian. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, get kind of the big players earlier before you, you know, kind of have before you're done formulating some stuff. Yep. Yep. Well, that's good. Hmm. Nikki, does this cap do you, are we capturing what you're going for? Um, sounds good. Yes, they are different groups. Uh, and I, I think uh, for the collaboration and to make this work as a community, yes, you need the business tie in. And with the people, it, it's not that we aren't going to learn what we get with the big players, but eventually it, it's a way of engaging them because ultimately we'll need everyone. Yeah. Yes, you're doing, this is great. Okay, Scott. So between commercial, business, private, we know that people are at different levels of, of how they feel about climate change, right? We know that we've surveyed across um, <clears throat> where I'm a bit interested in is what you guys are focusing on is in generally the questions of what they're doing. What are they doing about it? That's what I'm hearing you guys say. What are you doing about it? What are you doing within your business and, or you know, privately? That's one question. But when we get to the point where first we know what people know about climate change, two is what they're doing about it, but third, what is their, what are they willing to do? What are they willing to give up? What are they willing to invest in? That's a deeper, bigger question. And what are they willing to do without in order to make sure that we are making an impactful change to climate change? So I, I think that's a third level that is pretty intense that we're gonna to have to really decide on whether we're gonna survey the population or the business or the commercial industry on that too. So just yeah. to, that's a third phase we need to consider. Yeah, I think, yeah, the way that I would phrase that is why why, what are the reasons that are stopping you from doing more as it relates to businesses? Cause that is the, that like you could, if you did a survey around like, do you care about energy efficiency? It, you're going to get a hundred out of a hundred say yes. You mm -hmm. know, and then you're going to ask like, well, what are you doing about it? And you're going to get a bunch of answers. And then the, the question that you're asking is like, well, what are the hurdles for you? Like, why wouldn't you do more? Right. And and that's, is it a money thing? Is it a capacity thing? Is it an education thing? Like what, you know, it's going to be one of those things, right? Like, oh, I didn't know, or I couldn't afford it, or I didn't have time, you know, and that's, I think what you're getting at. Is that what you're getting at? No, I'll take it one step further. Once we make a strategy, that there's a, there's an investment to that strategy. Once we do that as a city, right? Um, that it's going to be shared across the board between all the residents and all the, are they, ex, are they finding that acceptable? So I just wanna make sure we don't go down the road where we make huge investments that we, we're trying to create strategies or huge investments in reducing our carbon footprint and we don't, and the residents of the city don't find it acceptable. I wanna make sure we understand what they find acceptable going forward. Right, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And residents, I'll, I'll say it again, I'm, that's a whole, I have no idea what they'll say, but. Um, yeah, that, no, that's good. Yeah, we gotta we gotta get their appetite for how motivated they are. So or or how we can motivate them. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think what Scott is saying though is a right. That's a useful frame for us to have because I think right. If you have a survey that like, what do you do? You think climate change is happening or not? That in some sense doesn't even really matter to what they think about what we're actually trying to do. Right. If they're not willing to 
you know, to take advantage of programs or to, you know, to invest in, in these different ways, then that's really what we're asking. So, and I'm sure, yeah, as we start to formulate what exactly those questions are, but it's a good framework. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring examples back to you. This isn't like the best example in some ways, but to give you a flavor of it, like I've had a long experience asking types of questions on surveys like this that says, you know, hey, do you like parks? <laughs> yes. Hey, like, like, what do you know about parks? What are the amenities that you'd most like in parks, right? But at some point it gets down to the line, gets down to, you know, and this isn't perfectly applicable, but it kind of is. Are you willing to, play, to pay two mils more a year to pay for that? And oh, by the way, like two mils generally means this much on a house that is valued this much, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's some, that, that's what I hear Scott saying. And I think there's wisdom in that of depending on it, you know, some of the things that we're talking about, I think. Sure we can ask those types of questions too. Yeah, I, it's, I think of knowledge, like, yeah, yeah. I think- so We'll bring all of those things back to you. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, I think you guys got a sense of at least a good first draft and we'll go from there on making it better. And that's great that the Frost Center is close by and a, and, and a trusted, uh, trusted ally in this for you guys, that's awesome. You mentioned Julie Ornay. Is that your point of contact there? That's awesome. I went to I, I went to Hope with Julie. She's great. Um, cool. Well, that's good. Anything else related to this discussion, or is that a good first start? That was. I thought it was a good first start. It's a good start. Great. Cool. Well then, moving right along into our education topic for the afternoon. Uh, education topic today is education. <laughs> yeah, and if I can if I can introduce this real quick as well, I want to thank Ann Salyers for putting this together. This is an example of what you're going to see today a little bit is an example of how this whole process of the community energy plan iteration and renewal and revisiting works. Um, and the fact that Ann is going to be giving some history as well as getting to um, a little, little detail about what's currently happening, because there's a task force that was put in motion in 2018 as part of the last strategic development team review mm -hmm. to develop this education plan. And so Anne's going to talk about the work that's going on. You should know that it's not complete yet. Um, and so there's some good opportunity, I think, for this group to give some feedback and input into that as well. But it's just a real example of how this is a process that continues to renew and continues to be worked on. And this is just specifically here with education, right in the middle of kind of this last SDT work going into finishing it by 2021. And so uh, really glad to have Ann here today. She's been with this process, you know, all along and uh, been instrumental in, in helping our community come up to speed on a lot of things related to energy efficiency and, and uh, wise use of those resources in our community. So Ann is our, um, with the Holland BPW is our community energy services manager. And I uh, want to turn it over to her so she can walk through this presentation for you this afternoon. So uh, Ann, take it away. Okay. Well, thanks, Dave. And uh, can you see the slides on your screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi. Right. Right. <laughs> well, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, and also for your service all the time you're giving to the community energy plan and making forward progress on it. And as Dave said, I am uh, one of the Community Energy Plan 2021 Tactical Action Team members. And we're charged with developing a multi-year energy education plan that's intended to then be funded and implemented um, from 2022 to 2025. So um, yes, I think uh, an activity that you know you might have 
down the road is going through this plan and maybe plucking out some of the things that really stand out to you in it. So think of it as um, an energy education playbook that uh, you can find your best plays in. So there are three parts to what I plan to cover in, um, over the next 20 minutes or so. And that is um, what the CEP has to say about community energy education, uh, what education efforts have taken place over the last 10 years, and what we the, what the current energy education tactic team is working on. It'll give you background to then deliberate on what energy education strategies, goals, metrics you want to recommend be accomplished by 2025. Oh. <laughs> Was that a big sigh? <laughs> <laughs> Um, an important element in the mission of the Community Energy Plan is improving energy literacy and awareness. And throughout this presentation, I've put in bold, and you'll see that like at the bottom of the page here, um, what those items are so they stand out a little bit more, but uh, uh, you see them in context of the whole plan. So education is not only part of the mission of the community uh, energy plan, it's also a key community value as you see in that uh, diagram mm -hmm. in the house. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a snip of the table of contents of the community energy plan. And the um, community energy plan report covers three main areas after the various scenarios for future power generation are discussed, it then recommends, and that's what you see here, several scale projects. And the home energy retrofit program uh, resulted from scale project number two that you see on that list. Mm -hmm. And then there are nine enabling mechanisms. And the Onbell loan program is an example of addressing enabling mechanism number one, you know, uh, financial incentives. Community education is in addressed in enabling mechanism number four and number five. And if you look at the page numbers, you'll see that there's only one page out of this 147 page document that talks about education in the community. So, you know, there's not, um, a whole lot to go on. A, a lot is left up to us to uh, figure out what would be best. But um, on page 69, if you go back and you know read that in the plan, it describes the intent of each of these enabling mechanisms and why it is important. It leaves the how up to us. You know it. it really kind of makes a case for why education is important, but doesn't give um, much clue as to how to do that. Maybe just a few suggestions. So enabling mechanism number four calls for establishing a process to regularly and systematically measure public understanding of energy use and supply. Um, so that's exactly what you were talking about uh, just before this. Mm -hmm. And uh, the results will guide ongoing public energy education and training. And um, however, there are, um, it, it talks about how there are studies um, of the public that shows that the public has relatively good understanding of like recycling issues or transportation choices, but there were large gaps in understanding energy use in homes and in buildings, uh, the potential of energy efficiency and a lack of overall energy literacy is how it's phrased. So good general knowledge by the community about the complexities of energy use and supply and its impacts on everyday life and future risk is critical to achieving the goals of the community energy plan. So it recommends conducting surveys, holding workshops, sending out flyers as ways to engage the, and the community and improve um, overall energy literacy. 
Now, the enabling mechanism number five uh, calls for energy education in all sectors, schools, colleges, uh, workforce training to be ongoing and that it's critical for breakthrough energy performance. Um, but that's, like I said, all there is. So it's, it's not an easy task. Um, most cities and utilities do not have departments um, that are dedicated to delivering community education like they do for delivering other services such as public safety or uh, running water. So I think um, we might need to develop a different uh, mindset about uh, prioritizing um, education. So with that said, there's a lot that has been accomplished over the last uh, 10 years after the Garforth report was presented to city council, BPW um, initiated Six, uh, a six week series of community education events called P21, which stood for power for the 21st century. And each week there was a, a different topic that was discussed in depth to help the community understand uh, complex aspects of uh, power generation. So one week was fuel types and then um, different ways that you can generate power. And uh, you can see that energy conservation and efficiency was the focus of another session. And they were um, quite well attended, um, anywhere from, oh, 30 to 60 uh, people a session. And um, in some ways, they're not unlike the Living Sustainably Along the Lakeshore series, but it was you know, very focused trying to get at the future power generation issue. And then that led to the uh, sustainable return on investment process, which engaged many community stakeholders, you know, coming together to identify and weight the desired uh, NEBs or non-energy benefits um, in the power generation technology question at the time. And that process was also very educational for all. Um, so 2012 is also when the um, Community Energy Plan task forces were formed. And you see that uh, community education and outreach was, reach was one of those six. And um, then each year, um, each activity has an element of education that uh, results. So specific to the Community Education and Outreach Task Force, its recommendation was the formation of the Holland Hope College Sustainability Institute. And um, to be an entity to coordinate and spearhead energy education delivery, and also to be a third party reporting to the community on the progress of uh, Holland was making on the community energy plan. A funders grant and a community foundation grant plus a three year funding commit from, commitment from the city and BPW is what helped to get it started. And then uh, Michelle Gibbs was hired um, as the part-time director and uh, did a great deal to create a website and a blog where information and events um, could be posted and exchanged. She coordinated the Living Sustainably along the Lakeshore events um, that were in partnership with Herrick Library, the city, um, the League of Women Voters, Hope College, MAC, ODC, um, and other organizations that partnered in that. And those continue today um, and now led by uh, Joe Sigma, as does the weekly Living Sustainably along uh, the Living Sustainably column that's in uh, the Sunday Sentinel each week. Uh, Michelle also developed a, an annual sustainability report um, as, um, and which served as the dashboard to inform uh, the community how we were doing on different metrics. So um, there's a page for each of the seven uh, sustainability framework elements. So this is a snapshot of what the smart energy page um, looked like. And um, the, uh, 
a firm, uh, fairly painless um, marketing firm, uh, has uh, done a lot of donated time to help uh, develop this report. So um, continuing on to 2015, we broke ground on Holland Energy Park. And uh, that's the year the Holland Energy Fund was incorporated. And part of the reason for setting up Holland Energy Fund uh, as a nonprofit, which now has 501c3 tax status, was to be able to pursue and receive grants and donations for energy education from foundations and businesses. You know, we really haven't um, gone out and pursued that yet, but um, it's structured to be able to, to do that. Um, so in these years, uh, we were immersed in the uh, Georgetown University Energy Prize competition for a $5 million cash prize. And while the uh, prize money uh, never materialized, was a mirage, it did uh, provide a sense of urgency um, to educate the community on reducing energy consumption. So there were a lot of initiatives and activities, um, including many clever videos and um, involvement by Holland Youth Advisory Council, HIAC, setting up uh, energy wars competition between the high schools. And there was also a knock on every door campaign that paired a HIAC student with an escape ministry student to go door to door giving out light bulbs and energy information to every door in the city of Holland. And uh, that information included what was called the super tips. And uh, super stood for uh, switch to LED, unplug electronics, prepare your furnace, which meant uh, change your filter, uh, eliminate old appliances. In other words, get rid of that second old refrigerator and reduce water temperatures. So these are things that um, take uh, very little money and uh, everybody can do them. And uh, they make quite a difference on um, seeing our residential energy consumption go down. Then in uh, 2017, the Community Energy Plan Governance Model was changed to add the Strategic Development Team, which you see the arrow pointing to there. And it was charged, like you, to research and recommend a set of interim strategies and goals to be accomplished by the end of 2021. So kind of that three to five year time frame. And this was to ensure that momentum and forward progress um, was made on the plan and that uh, this community energy plan does not sit on a shelf. So I think that's one of the things that other communities really admire about our plan is um, how much progress we've made on it and continue to uh, work hard at it. And uh, this was the year that the first uh, um, dashboard like that page I showed you on the previous slide was uh, published. And so there's been one annually. Um, <laughs> then 2018, the Holland Energy Park uh, Education Center, known as the Visitor Center, opened. And that, that's a $1.3 million investment that was made um, uh, specifically to educate school groups and the public on energy tran generation, transmission, distribution, saving energy at home, uh, careers in energy, and uh, much more. So it's a tremendous community asset to leverage when we get past COVID. Um, so many of the things that you see listed here are being worked on by various tactic teams using the process um, that you see across the bottom of the page, which is that study, plan, pilot, and then operationalize. Um, here's the list of the 2021 tactic team projects um, with uh, expand and fund energy education. It's the eighth one on the list um, is in bold, but uh, it gives you the list of 
what are the current teams working on? Some of these things have already been accomplished, like um, developing a um, city municipal alternative fuel purchasing policy for all vehicles and gas powered equipment and calculating the carbon footprint uh, every other year. And then um, what's also transpired, you know, there are all these things toward the community energy plan is all along while this was going on um, has been the energy waste reduction program, which started in 2009 and fulfills a state law for utilities to achieve a 1% energy savings uh, year over year. And the program offers incentives for energy efficiency upgrades to all customer classifications in the service territory. So not just um, uh, the city of Holland, but the whole territory. And it's funded by a surcharge on everybody's monthly electric and gas bills. 5% uh, of that budget that we receive may be used for education and demonstration projects. Um, uh, having been at it for 10 years now, um, it's really hard to, the need is much greater than 5%. <laughs> so um, there's so much of um, uh, education that needs to go with um, that program that, uh, um, really we could use more than 5% out of the budget and the rest is used for incentives and um, the programs that are offered and ways to return that money back to people. So um, something else that uh, has also transpired is the city contracting recently with um, the Outdoor Discovery Network to deliver sustainability education to the community, including energy. And to spearhead that, um, ODC Network, as you know, and hi, Joe, um, uh, hired Joe Sigma, who is uh, continuing the Living Sustainably series and the columns and events, and also doing um, a lot of uh, benchmarking to help this committee. So with that uh, brief background, um, trying to go over the last 10 years um, in a short amount of time of what has uh, been done to build energy literacy in the community. And I might add that you've really just seen the tip of the iceberg um, with what was on those slides. Um, really could expound on uh, many things and um, show you all kinds of videos that have been created. And, you know, maybe there's some that uh, could be recycled, but, um, you know, what's the current tactic team working on? So that's what I'd like to get into now. <clears throat> and it is one of eight project teams. And by the end of 2021, it is asked to create a longer term energy education plan while keeping some of the current ed energy education programs going. You know, most of the other projects, um, you know, if you're reading across the row here, have estimated greenhouse gas reduction um, associated with it on this chart. But with um, education, it's um, indirect. Um, recall that I said the energy waste reduction program um, allocates 5% that can be spent toward education and pilot programs. Um, we actually get to claim some savings, uh, kilowatt hour savings based on a formula for what we spend um, on education. It kind of works out to every dollar we spend on education is 6.8 kilowatt hours in savings that we can attribute to it. And our team is uh, led by Mark Vanderplug and also includes Michelle Gibbs, um, so we have the Hope College perspective on it. Ken Freestone as the Home Energy um, Retrofit Program Residential Energy Advisor has been on the team. Uh, Joe um, with ODC Network is on it. And 
um, Aaron Thalenwood, who um, has been heading up the, you know, recycling uh, solid waste program um, and uh, has been the representative of the city to the um, USDN, the Urban uh, Sustainability Directors Network for the city. He, you know, he's moved to the West Michigan Airport Authority, um, but uh, I understand uh, interviews took place, first round ones for a new sustainability manager that's going to be coming on board. And um, on this, you can also read the problem statement and the milestones. Um, in short, the team is developing a plan by the end of 2021 to be implemented from 2022 through 2025. You can see that we're about 60% complete with this uh, plan. The intent today is to give you a sense of what the plan contains. And uh, you'll also have opportunity to give opinion into the plan as we finish up the work this spring. Uh, for example, from sitting in on these you know, meetings, I've gleaned that you um, would like emphasis on and see the most opportunity for greenhouse gas reduction coming from the commercial and industrial sector. So we've prioritized that audience as high um, and residential as uh, more moderate in the plan in terms of the um, priorities. So this education, or uh, this plan is titled Educating for Action. And the purpose is to engage the um, Holland community. Um, and, you know, we want to um, not only increase energy literacy, but also to the point where it spurs action um, because the success depends on everybody's support and participation. So we wanna raise awareness of energy related issues, um, spur action and stewardship by individuals and businesses, garner support for investments in uh, individual property, um, neighborhood, city and regional levels, and then motivate action by homeowners and businesses, um, not-for-profit organizations and educational institutions. And again, the intent is for the plan to be designed by the end of um, this year, and then to be funded and implemented uh, from 2022 to 2025. You know, right now the city's starting into its um, budgeting process for that time period. So um, that's why we're trying to get this um, uh, moved along, wrapped up um, by the end of spring. The plan also includes some key messages like you'll see here. I you know, won't take time to read through all, all of them, but just know those are in the plan, you know, as far as what we want people to know. Um, and it is also mindful of the barriers that get in the way. You know, moving the needle on energy liter literacy requires a relentless effort. Uh, a lot of repetition, you know, many mediums, um, ways of communicating to people and investment of people, dollars and time. Um, it's hard to get people's attention. Um, part of that is, you know, energy efficiency is something that you can't see, touch, smell, hear. <laughs> uh, so it's not as tangible as uh, um, other things are. Nonetheless, there are clues to communication strategy, strategies that can be used to reach people that we've gleaned from um, surveys that have been done um, and over the, in, over the years and um, such as, you know, that local businesses value energy initiatives that impact the bottom line, uh, savings and comfort matter. Um, Holland residents are increasingly uniting around climate issues. Um, also, Holland residents like free stuff. So um, <laughs> that uh, always gets them out. Um, emerging is uh, motivating residents to change their behavior through social norms. 
So you may not know that Holland is actually engaged is in a study that the University of Michigan is doing that's funded by the National Science Foundation um, and that uh, Holland is the locale for this study. Hmm. And um, the hypothesis of the study is that people will respond more to comparisons with others who are like them, you know, not just their physical neighbor. So, you know, may have heard of, uh, you know, consumers has had where they send out letters to homeowners and it shows how, uh, and you get a smiley face or a frowny face if you've used more energy than your neighbor. Well, rather than just your physical neighbor, this research, um, the first round of it identified six patterns of residential energy consumption, um, you know, mostly, and this isn't, uh, is it showing up on your screen across the bottom, the different groups? I think, uh, Anne, if you go to your next, you've just got right now just the control group, uh, neighbor group and profile group, but I think this same slide will edit. There you go. There, there. You go. okay, it's a yeah. build. There you go. <laughs> yep. Yeah, this because this is the fun part to see. Um, and uh, so they identified uh, these six patterns, and you can decide which one you might uh, fall in, of um, energy consumption, mostly related to the time uh, that you use energy the most during the day. Hmm. So it's um, the study, they're now starting to f into a phase of sending users messages based upon their consumption patterns um, or affinity or profile group. And so it'd be fun to learn the results of it. So, you know, they think people will respond um, more to, um, you know, a profile groups uh, mm -hmm. like this and, and they'll see more action, people taking action than by just compared to your neighbor. Um, so I think it'll be, um, interesting. Um, so it'll, it, the other thing that's nice about this study is it's a subtle education tactic. It's making people more aware of their energy use. And one of the reasons that we agreed to be the profile site, the education plan also follows the loading order themes listed in the um, community energy plan. Um, and that's what's in text here. If you don't need it, don't use it. That's um, where energy efficiency comes into play. If it's already there, use it um, like heat recovery, like we do for snow melt, et cetera. Um, and it also follows, um, it or continues educating on the hierarchy or the sequence, the energy efficiency period pyramid of the low cost, no cost things to do. You know, what sequence should you um, make energy efficiency improvements on your home? And um, for CNI customers, it uses the nine energy ways that we teach in the strategic energy management program. Um, additional messaging in the education plan is how energy awareness and action fits within the Holland sustainability framework, you know, primarily within the element of smart energy, which is the making of wise um, energy efficient choices. Um, but as you read the other elements, the uh, mission of the CEP and what is to be what it's to accomplish for Holland, um, it really delivers on all framework elements, but uh, clearly energy the strongest. Okay, now um, this is getting into some of the charts in the in the plan. Um, the messaging of this education plan is aimed at whom? There are so many different uh, groups to reach. I mean, you in your previous discussion, we're talking about all the uh, various groups in the community. Um, the, in it, we suggest a prioritization. Um, the plan is really a menu of recommendations from which to choose. 
and um, available resources will determine how deep we can go into implementing the plan. So the left column on this uh, page suggests the priority based upon the largest impact to reducing greenhouse um, gas emissions. You know, if that's the ultimate goal we're trying to get at um, is the uh, greatest reduction we can in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, maybe focus on where can we get the biggest bang for the buck. So the target group is the um, customer classification or wedge of the carbon footprint pie. Um, so it was industrial, commercial, residential, transportation. And so the um, right-hand column, uh, you know, lists those, uh, oh, and then the right-hand column lists subgroups within each of those. But, um, you know, here you see we've rated uh, industrial and commercial high um, and institutional. And then um, the residential sector and transportation more moderate. And that's strictly because of sort of their portion of the total um, emissions uh, pie right now. But yet a lot of the focus to date has really been on residential. And we were just starting with this last strategic development team to take a look at transportation in a, a few ways. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the plan are the examples of um, the current perceptions and then through the actions of the plan, what the desired outcome perceptions uh, become. Here's uh, an example of a, a CNI one. Um, and uh, remember the barriers to energy efficiency I spoke of earlier. Did we skip over that slide, the barrier? No, we, no, we hit that. Okay. All right. Um, there are a lot of uh, small business owners um, out there who would say, you know, I'm just too busy running my business to focus on energy reduction. So the messaging um, might be to make them aware of the great rebates that we have for small businesses in the BPW Energy Smart Program. And then they'd realize that being more energy efficient was actually easy and helped, uh, it helped me save money that I could reinvest in the business. So that's how the, this messaging works. Another tack uh, focusing on uh, in general could be educating on the elective uh, renewable energy rate that green companies attract uh, more business. You know, here's one um, uh, about homeowners. You know, a current perception might be that my electric and heating bills are high and my house is drafty, but there's not much I can do about it. Educating for action might be explaining the home energy retrofit program and on bill loan programs, where the outcome is the homeowner saying, a few investments. Uh, in my made my home more comfortable and lowered my uh, bills. Paying for the improvements was convenient and easy. Now, what if I'm a renter? It might be the same current perception, um, but the messaging would be different. You know, here we might, to this group, promote the lower my bill home energy checkup um, would help a renter learn that there are a few simple um, DIY improvements that don't take a lot of time or money. And, you know, I can go on and on like this, you know, like for landlords, uh, real estate agents, other audiences that we're trying to reach, all this information is um, in the plan. And, you know, we realize there are more headwinds to improving energy literacy in the community. So also included in the plan is a list of strategies that, you know, we're trying to uh, employ in the plan. You know, again, I'm not going to read through this. You can come back to it, but know that this is all in our thought process of how we're trying to 
approach it. The um, <clears throat> sample tactics, um, you know, this playbook or, or menu in here is um, set up like this in the plan. And I've pulled out just a, a snip of, uh, out of a couple of examples, you know, for commercial and industrial, this one in the first row is uh, talking about some of the ways we might partner with the chamber to deliver energy education. So you'll see some delivery tactics, then the key messages that could be used, the timeline that this would take place. So this one over the three years of um, the plan. And then um, the estimated budget that would be required. Mark and I are getting together tomorrow to um, work on estimating these for the CNI tactics. And then who would be the responsible department? Um, and uh, so the fact that, you know, we don't have all of this filled in is, you know, why we're estimating we're about 60% done with the, the plan. But uh, most of the tactics are falling into one of two groups as far as the responsible party, either the city's new economic development and sustainability department, or uh, Holland BPW's energy waste reduction program. Although just for a joke, Ann, and just to give you a break, I noticed that all of the examples that you had all listed the city of Holland, the, the new new position. So <laughs> I, I, I don't so know pleasant. if there's a subtle message there or something, Ann, I mean, come uh -huh. on. <laughs> Yeah, this, that's this uh, so that it can be thoroughly funded and accelerated. Well, I just <laughs> want to emphasize the need for the position, Keith, is what we were trying to do. So. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. That, that we, that we uh, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole other thing in the middle of COVID and tight budgets, but. Uh, yeah, well, we, believe we're me. Making, we're going in the right direction, right, Ann? Yeah, in the. Um, uh, plan, there's uh, a whole lot in there where it's uh, um, BPW is assigned to it. Um, you know, this one has some residential uh, education tactics um, in it, you know, and we're now up to 15 pages of these. You know, this, this is the plan, the whole thing. We've got 40 pages already um, in this plan and 15 are charts like this with um, ideas in them. And um, so, you know, on this page, we're talking about um, general graphic design, the website, what uh, might be done with signage downtown, um, following that, you know, same matrix um, of audience, delivery tactic, key message, timeline, estimated budget, and responsible department. And uh, the responsible department doesn't mean, it, it is more the who's um, getting it done. It doesn't mean they're the ones doing it. You know, so it's bringing in partners and um, others from around the community. Okay, um, there are also metrics in this plan. Um, ways to measure success, uh, surveys and focus groups are good ways to test if perceptions have changed. Um, program participation rates, attendance at events, number of EVs per capita, the every other year carbon footprint calculation are all good ways to measure if uh, people have actually taken action. So those are um, suggested in this plan as well. And then to close out the plan, there's uh, an appendix of acronyms, references, resources. So I you know, hope this overview um, has helped to illustrate how much effort has gone into community energy literacy education already, um, that it's not enough. Uh, in fact, some would say, hit the gas pedal harder, invest more. Um, I wouldn't disagree with that by any means. It's you know, perhaps the most challenging component of the community energy plan because it's never complete. 
you know, it's like it's never enough. <laughs> um, but it's our hope that this uh, education plan, um, you know, educating for action um, can serve as a useful playbook. And thank you, Ann. Yeah, so just uh, to wrap up next steps, um, the next uh, CEP steering committee meeting that this plan will be reviewed at is March 4th. Um, with those edits, um, we think that by late March, we could have uh, a copy um, to put in the resource document. Uh, it still would be listed as a draft, but um, it would, um, allow you access to what's there to help with your deliberations. And then uh, we hope by the June 3rd uh, quarterly steering committee meeting that uh, we have the final draft ready to go. Sure. Well, thank you, Anne. You're welcome. Good progress. Yeah. Um, that was a little trip back in time, Ann. It had been a while. I, I, I remember going to lots of those things back in the day. Yes, you were, you were at that um, original rally at Park Theater. Oh, um, we divided into task forces. Yeah. I was, wasn't, uh, there even a, wasn't there even a picture of Brian in there sitting at a table with six young students? Oh, was yeah, that, that, that was that was a video he did where he was asking kids about energy efficiency and it's it's hilarious <laughs> i saw you brian i caught that <laughs> i i don't know what oh, that was brian I, birch in that video oh okay i had the wrong i thought it looked like brian but it was really small i'm my my bad uh -huh. that, that makes me feel so much better because I literally was about to say, I do not remember what you're talking about. <laughs> For good reason. But I have a but I don't have a great memory. So I was like, sure, I guess, you know. <clears throat> I so um anyways, and that is uh yeah, I don't it's hard to know what other yeah, communities have done and as it relates to education, but I would put a fair amount of money on not many have done uh, what you guys have done and to the extent that you've done it. And into still having done all of that, be in a spot where you know it's, you know, not enough is, um, it just tells, it just tells uh, a really important story. This, you know, this is hard work to stay top of mind with people and technology changes and rules change and incentive programs change. And I mean, there's just, it's a very dynamic fluid thing. And, and it's hard to, it's hard to give people relevant context in an ongoing meaningful way so that they do act, uh, you know, or give them the best chance to act. And so I know you guys have been doing a ton of work on it and uh, thanks for that presentation. Um, and our hope today would be, I think, as far as the educational thing, again, if there's any questions that anybody has, and I know Scott chatted one out, but if there's any questions on what Ann has delivered, you know, she's available for those questions, but also to maybe at some point, it's still strategies, but, and I know she didn't want to read the entire list. It's a long list, but you can see those up there uh, and maybe just to kind of see what they're thinking about in terms of kind of the overall strategies to make sure that they get any feedback, even at this point, as to prioritization or feeling from this group as to, you know, given everything that's happened in the past and looking at what we need right now, you know, where is the focus heading in the right direction for them? You know, so that's very valuable feedback, but, but any questions anybody has, I know Ann would, would answer those. Well, I'd like to answer Scott's question, if I may, which is he's asking how much do we do with uh, public and private schools? And um, there is a really terrific program that we've been doing in partnership with SEMCO and the National Energy Foundation that, um, reaches every fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you know, while a student is in that set of grades, they'll get this um, presentation program uh, at least once. And 
Um, the National Energy Foundation comes and does um, a really fantastic hands-on workshop with the kids and sends them home with a kit of uh, energy saving um, devices that uh, both save uh, electricity and um, uh, natural gas consumption. And um, they do this kit with their parents and bring back their completed uh, homework assignment. So it's a great way to educate the parents on some of this stuff too. And then the classroom, if they get a high enough percentage of the assignments returned, um, that classroom teacher gets um, money for educational supplies for the classroom. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So that's our main program with the schools. And we do that at uh, public and private schools. That's an impressive list. It's a very impressive list. And I, I agree that it, in with you and with Brian, it's ongoing. And somehow we have to address that gap between here are these strategies or proposed strategies and what is actually happening on the ground. As we know with the retrofit program, the goals were one thing and what actually happened is another thing. So it's a great idea and a great program how do we move that forward, make it happen? Maybe faster, better, mm -hmm. you know, just because we're all high achievers. And we want it to happen. Yep. And the, um, the sustainability dashboard thing that Michelle was working on and fairly painless, is that, is that still a thing that gets updated or not? It has been, yes. So um, there is a current one that she um, wrapped up. Um, I think that's a question uh, maybe for this group on do enough people know about it? Do people use it? Is it uh, should a different method be used to communicate results to the community? And there's that gap again, you know, here it is. It's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess we could, let's just do a quick straw poll here. Did anyone know that that dashboard existed? And if you did, how, when's the last time you've looked at it? Mm. And Nikki, I'm, I'm going to say something maybe potentially controversial here, right? It's not just a gap analysis sometimes. It's was the strategy that we were really going for actually a goal that we want to continue to pursue because we could be updating that dashboard. I think that's what Brian's asking and we could spend a lot of time and effort and money in that. But if it doesn't drive a result, then that's one of the things that we ask ourselves all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Is it working? <laughs> well, yeah, or is there a better way to do it? Yeah. yeah exactly. right. I mean, I don't even like, I mean, I knew about that thing years ago, but I didn't, if it does, if it has been updated, I don't, it doesn't somehow, I haven't paid attention to it crossing my plate. And I don't even know like what is actually reported on it, to be honest. So I don't like, but maybe I'm the only one, maybe everybody else knows exactly what that is and references it every quarter. Mm, I, I don't think so. <laughs> so it's essentially doesn't exist. Well, not to the six of us, but. <laughs> Are we representative? <laughs> a sample. Um, interesting. Is that, is that continually, what's the, do you, in your plan and your current work, is there commentary on that dashboard one way or the other, Anne? Oh, um, I don't know. I'd have to go back and, and look. Yeah, the, they're actually, I'd say right now that's in flux. Um, there isn't a specific plan for how that will go forward. Okay. Okay. Well, and just to, and just to kind of add on to that, I mean, the dashboard is, as Ann pointed out, it's covering all the elements of the sustainability framework. Smart energy is one of those. Mm -hmm. So she showed you a smart energy page, but there's, 
there's, I think, seven different elements of the sustainability framework. So that dashboard, correct me if I'm wrong, Ann, that dashboard would be something that is intended to be more full encompassing of the entire progress on a sustainability framework for the community, correct? That's right. Yeah, there's a page like the smart energy page um, for each framework element. And it draws from data from Lakeshore Advantage, um, the city, um, BPW, SEMCO. So that's a beyond, sorry to jump in, that's a beyond the community energy plan dashboard. There's a lot of other yeah. components there. Got it. And when you say that's in flux, are you, and maybe this belongs outside of the context of this meeting, I don't know. Is that because HOPE is maybe not funding that program anymore or they, or we, or we don't understand? Yeah, yeah. why is that in flux? Well, um, we were not um, able to figure out a funding model to continue the um, Sustainability Institute in the way it had been. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, Michelle is not serving um, in the same way as um, the director. We haven't gotten rid of the name or the website because it's still useful and people use that. Um, you know, she's now the Hope College Sustainability Director. And then, you know, the city, um, has uh, contracted for energy or sustainability education, not just mm -hmm. energy education, sustainability mm -hmm. education with ODC network. Got it. So that's so that. you know I think there's a um, opportunity to um, examine how we have been doing things and um, it could change, but some of the good stuff um, that's been working well, um, like the Living Sustainably Along the Lakeshore series, the partnering organizations um, still seem very committed to continuing that series. Got it. Brian, I, can you have Joe jump in? And because I think he's he's been working on that. I mean, it might be good to hear what he said on that year question around the dashboard. If you want more answers than that. I, if there are, I don't, I mean, that makes, I, I just wasn't sure what the status of it was. So okay. um, yeah, Joe, if you have more to add to what Ann said, that's fine. And if not, that's fine too. Yeah, I can just give some quick perspective. So that report, that dashboard is technically called the annual report. It's a unique thing that city of Holland does. It's not something that most communities do. We've been recognized for it in the past and some of those groups like USDN and ICWI um, as something that they like to see from cities like us. Um, but they're definitely with the transition from Michelle to the ODC running that, it's no longer gonna be branded under the Hope Holland Sustainability Institute. So there's some changes that happen. Another thing to recognize too, uh, the 2020 report that was produced, this it's the latest one that you'll see online, takes data from 2019 and a little beyond just because COVID cost and craziness was reporting there. Um, but we do have plans to release a 2021 report. It'll look a little bit different just because of those changes with how it's managed. Um, but that will be ongoing. Just there's some some gray area and ambiguity in what will be there because um, it's going to be new. So, okay. Yep. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> are, are there other, I have one more question for Ann, unless there's other questions mm -hmm. for Ann and about her presentation. All right. And um, so you mentioned 5% uh, of the energy waste reduction budget goes towards education and that you um, think that there could be a lot more um, or something like that, right? You mentioned that if it was more, that wouldn't be a bad thing. Is, the, is that rooted in, because you're, is that because, um, the 1% goal hasn't been getting hit and therefore you need more education dollars or is it like parts of the one, like maybe certain sectors aren't hitting the 1% or just sort of unpack why you could spend more money on education. Like where is it sort of falling, not falling short is maybe a negative way to describe it, but where do you see the opportunity? 
Well, um, first of all, we are um, have been very fortunate, I think, um, as a community in that um, we have not had trouble meeting the 1% goal and um, often do it with far less uh, budget than what the state would allow us to spend. Mm -hmm. um, so the results in Holland on the energy waste reduction program have been very good. Um, what I was referring to is that um, in managing that program, we have to be very careful in not overspending in education and uh, pilot programs that um, it's easy. <laughs> We've had many opportunities to um, uh, provide educational uh, activities and events and, um, you know, like that program that we do in the um, uh, middle schools, you know, for the fourth to sixth graders. And, um, you know, I'd love to expand that programs like that, but don't have the dollars to do it because of this limitation of not being able to spend more than 5% of the budget. Is that a state mandated limitation or is that just internally decided? No, that's uh, state mandated. So, so when, the good you, news is, is that after wow. um, uh, this calendar year, that our program, we no longer fall under the state mandate and um, we've actually increased our budget for education and pilot. Increase the percentage? I know you increased the goal to 2%. Is the education just dollars increasing or is, it, or is the percentage 5% increasing as well? Um, I think it's uh, increasing as well. I'd have to go back and look at the plan, but... Uh, uh, we did want to put more emphasis um, and um, allocation toward education and demonstration projects. An example of demonstration project would be like when we relamped uh, Centennial Park to show um, the benefits of switching to LED and what dark sky lighting means. Um, and, you know, so businesses could learn from that for their parking lots um, and uh, or the uh, chromatic glass that's at the airport terminal. Mm. Uh, we did an energy study on, on that and um, uh, showed the energy savings over other conventional forms of technology, you know, glass that might be put in a facility. Yeah. So, Cool. That's great. Do people have questions for Ann or on any of this stuff? Nope. Nice work. Nice work. Okay. Good. Well, stay tuned. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Ann. That's great. Yeah, if I can just kind of close out that category of the agenda then, Mr. Chair. Um, so Ann's presentation today is the third lever of the five levers that are kind of identified in the opportunity matrix. Now we've been through electric portfolio, we've been through RECs and carbon offsets. Uh, we've now been through education. Mm -hmm. There's the building energy consumption and transportation levers yet that um, we'll be working towards. A reminder that out of the last uh, discussion on carbon offsets, there was an interest in understanding the um, calculation that's made on a community basis every year. And so Andrew Reynolds last uh, week, or la two weeks ago rather, uh, gave a presentation on that. Mm -hmm. And I guess just checking in at this point um, before we close that out, if there's any other questions that we need to bring back for Andrew or try to resolve in terms of that or whether this group now has a pretty good understanding. I know one of the things that came out of it is this need to understand what's going on inside of our community from an industry perspective on entities that might be already taking a role of, of offsetting their own emissions. Um, but uh, is there anything else that we need to sort of round out as it relates to that, that portion? Yes, Scott. Just as you asked that question, I would like to know 
uh, in the future if the 6.8 kilowatt hours that are credits toward education, you know, reduction in carbon footprint, if that will continue to grow um, or be about the same and then what maybe if we can apply that to future educational um, opportunities that we, we create, making sure that, that that is measured that way or, or can provide us a measurement so we can understand that. Yeah, I think we could probably glean some information from, even though there's not a mandate out there for the municipalities anymore, there are energy waste reduction programs that'll be reviewed by the Michigan Public Service Commission for the investor-owned utilities. And there's probably a lot of detail in those plans about how they're trying to give credit for the uh, educational elements of it. So I think in terms of whether or not that kind of relationship continues is something that we can keep track of. But there's also a consultant that's helped us develop our proposed plan going forward after the mandate. And uh, that entity does a lot of support for different utilities around the country. And so I think that could be another resource that we could use to see if that's a good relationship going forward, Scott. So we can continue to uh, uh, bring some information back on that. Good. Cool. Um, any meaningful comments about the draft report or the resources document this week? Oops. Not really. Um, there, I think uh, going forward, like Ann mentioned, we'll have some um, new resources here with the work that this group is doing hopefully later in March. So we'll be a couple, couple meetings away probably when they'll have been able to vet that again through the steering committee to kind of get to a point where they feel that it's ready for this group's consumption. Um, there's nothing else I think that's really been added to the resources document at this point. And so I don't think I have anything else to share there. Okay. Um, if we're, so the, the, we're gonna do building consumption next or transportation or we haven't decided? I think we need to work with you and uh, Travis on that, identify again, uh, you know, the uh, timing and the uh, most appropriate um, people to deliver the education message on, on those. Uh, transportation probably would be focused um, similarly to today where we'd give you a little bit of background on the work that we've done in adopting the um, policy changes within the city and the BPW as well as the incentive programs on electric vehicles. And then the, the remainder of that topic in transportation would probably be focused on the proposal from Ford Mobility as it relates to the, um, the bigger mobility strategy discussion within the community. Uh, and um, that is something we probably are ready to, to tackle in a couple of weeks. Um, or again, if we're gonna leave two weeks from now for that feedback on Ann's discussion and that exploration of the strategies, and then maybe two weeks from then is when we have that, that transportation piece. But again, that, that's something I think Keith and I can uh, work with you and, and Travis as the leadership of the STT to figure out for sure, Brian, how you want to handle that. Okay, that sounds good. If people have strong feelings about that, they can shoot us an email and Travis and I will work with Dave and Keith on mapping that out. But um, in particular, the, I think my the question that I'm just asking out loud in my head is, do we need a full meeting to unpack what the, you know, the opportunity matrix as it relates to what Ann just went through or, um, or not? You know, I think that that's sort of where my head's at is, can we do that unpacking and do the transportation in one meeting? And, and uh, I, I, I think we can, but maybe people have different thoughts and feelings. So Travis and Keith and I and Dave will we'll touch base, but if you have, you know, I would review the opportunity matrix relative to education, think on what Anne just went through. Yeah, and if you feel like there's a lot there to dig into, let us know. And then we'll, you know, factor that into whether we give a whole meeting for that or not. Could we have a copy of digital copy of what Ann gave? Yeah, we'll add the presentation. The video will go up. So if you want to watch resource. the video again, but also we'll actually give the PowerPoint that would be into nice. the resources document as well. So you can review it. 
So yeah, absolutely. Keith, Keith, would you make a note to get Jeff a hard copy? That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> you can fly it over by carrier pigeon. That'd be yeah, the other thing, uh, Mr. Chair, not to put Joe on the spot here, but I know that he continues to make good work of the uh, community comparison um, document as well. And I, I don't know, two weeks from now, Joe, where do you think you'll be if you still are listening in here and able to chime in? Uh, where do you think we'll be in a couple of weeks on that? Yeah, I would say in two weeks, we'll have that fact finding document complete. So the initial survey of all those communities that identified in the three categories, um, and hopefully have narrowed down the deep dive communities. So we can start working on that next stage of getting the full picture of two or three communities that we think are close and good to compare ourselves to. Oh, wow. Cool. Yep. So, may so maybe leaving a little bit of time on the agenda two weeks from now, just to kind of see that in that state of having all three of those people, profit, planet, um, sections uh, filled out would be a good thing to maybe have in the agenda as well. Yeah, that's great. Sounds good. All right. Super. Is that, I guess, one comment? Um, um, go ahead, Jeff. Like, is it worth spending time in two weeks to do that? Or is it worth, like, if we can put that in the resource document and then give us two weeks to be able to look at it and then come back in a month? I don't know, just to try to use our time in next meeting well. Because I feel like there's, looking at the, the bits and pieces that we have so far, I feel like I know what Joe's going for, but there's so much there. <laughs> there is. There's so and much. I, like, I don't want to, I mean, if we pull it up, there's, I don't know how much we can get from it other than, cool. like, to be impressed by so much data. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's probably a both and, Jeff where I think Joe would kind of be able to introduce it a little bit um, and not that you'd have to make decisions at that point as much, but that he'd give, a, give us a guided introduction to it and then you would have time to spend with it also. Yeah, I guess the question is, Joe, can we, can we make available, even though it's a draft, maybe a read-only version or something like that that we could post out there? So if you wanted to sort of explode those particular areas to look at the details underneath them and really sort of get acquainted with what's going on underneath it. Ultimately, what that tool does, just a reminder, is that the tool has a lot of, it's going to have in the planet section, it'll have sort of, you know, goals that these communities are making and things like that, but also some initiatives that might be undertaken underneath the five levers that we are sort of exploring here in Holland. Mm -hmm. When we get these really good comparable communities, you know, Joe talks about this next phase. That's, that's more of kind of a, almost a one-on-one -on -one interaction, trying to find the individual responsible in those communities for <clears throat> leading those initiatives forward. And then really having a good detailed conversation about those that ultimately will find its way into the final report, you know, a little bit more detail in that. But, but I guess in terms of first glance, I'm just kind of throwing out there without, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this, but just, you know, kind of exploring whether or not a read only version is something that that makes sense for the resources document or not. Well, we've seen it before. I think it would be useful to have it. Is Joe, maybe a question for you on that. Like, so I feel like I know some of what you had put in at least last time you showed us. Um, make an informed guess. Like, do you think I have enough information that if you gave me the thing, I could poke around for an hour and, or do you think it would be useful to, to go over it again before you, you know, give me the steering wheel and let me drive? <laughs> yeah, great question. I think you have the concept of how the tool works so you could explore through it yourself. The only thing I'll have to work with Keith and Dave on this would be figuring out a format that will fit best in that report, knowing that right now it's set up as a Google sheet that you can expand and close. And if we're gonna make a read-only format, your printer for your hard copy might be working quite a bit, going through lots of paper, <laughs> and all of those data points laid out there. Oh. So we can work and see what we can do on that. Yo, you're my people. <laughs> <laughs> so so we'll work on that Jeff to meet you know I think that's something we do want to give you the ability to sort of poke around I would just have to figure out how to best do that okay and we can leave a short short part on the agenda maybe just so Joe can explain For what he's we, done give you that short tutorial so we can 
allow that to happen then after that time frame. Yeah, I just I I really want to spend some more time with that before we spend a chunk of the meeting talking about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So nice. Joe could give us that tutorial, then we can have time to noodle and uh, then have the discussions. Yeah, I'll touch base with Keith and Dave and try to figure out the best format for that and then we can go forward. Good. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, we, um, unless there's anything else, we've got meetings coming up on the 1st, the 15th, and the 29th of March. We've talked about a little bit of what's coming, and Travis, mm -hmm. Dave, and Keith and I will circle the wagons on that. Um, and if there's nothing else, I think we are adjourned, my friends. All righty. Good. Good meeting. All right. Yep. And thanks so much. Yes, yeah. and thank you. Awesome Thanks. work as always. Okay. All righty. See you in a couple of weeks. You bet. Adios.